Uh, good morning and welcome to the 2011 Royal Terrell Museum Speaker Series. Today the Royal Terrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present our very own Dr. Francois Therrien. Francois is a curator of dinosaur paleoecology here at the Royal Terrell Museum. Francois obtained his undergraduate degree in geology at the University of Montreal. He then moved to the U.S. Trader to pursue his master's degree in geosciences at the University of Rhode Island. As many of you might know, I'm American. <clears throat> uh, there he studied the paleosols of the late Triassic Chinle formation in order to reconstruct the paleo environments in which early theropods lived in the American Southwest. Subsequently, Francois moved to Baltimore to pursue his PhD in functional anatomy and evolution at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. For his dissertation, he studied the paleoenvironments of the latest Cretaceous dinosaur bearing formations of Romania. Fresh out of his PhD, Francois came to the Royal Trail Museum as an NSERC postdoctoral fellow and was later invited to join the ranks of the research staff uh, in 2006. Francois's primary research interests revolve around the study of dinosaur paleoenvironments and dinosaur behavior. Over the years, he has conducted field research in Canada, the United States, Romania, and Mongolia. Today, Francois will present an overview of the use of X-ray for paleontological research in a talk entitled, When X-rays and Dinosaurs Collide, Use of X-ray Imaging in Vertebrate Paleontology. So without further delay, I present to you Dr. Francois Therrien. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Mike, for the great introduction. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> uh, as many of you know, use of X-ray imaging is more and more often used for paleontological research. So I thought that I'd give you a little overview of the different uh, X-ray techniques used for paleontological research, and then spend the vast majority of the talk actually give you examples of uh, research that has used uh, x-rays as one of its techniques and some of that research I've been personally involved in. So if we look at the history of uh, paleontology, we see that the use of x-ray imaging is not a recent fad. It actually started way back when x-rays were first discovered. Uh, X-rays were first discovered in 1895 by a German uh, scientist, and then only nine months later, we have the first publication of the use of X-rays to take photos of, uh, of fossils. So in 1896, uh, paleontologists in Germany and in France just used the new, uh, newly discovered technique of X-rays to basically zap whatever specimens they had on their shells. So that's why the first X-ray images of fossils were of uh, fossil birds, dinosaurs, and even fossil mammals. So at first, paleontologists uh, use uh, X-rays just like a new toy, basically shoot first, ask questions later, and basically they just take that new technique for a spin and see what can be done for it. So it was really rudimentary and really basically casual. But it took 10 years before the first detailed study of, uh, of basically fossils using, using X-rays would actually be published. And it's in 1906 that paleontologists in Germany first use uh, x-rays to do some substantive work in describing new fossils. So they looked at fossils uh, that were basically lower Devonian, so basically invertebrates, marine invertebrates from the Hunsruck slate in Germany. And there the fossils were rich in pyrite, which is an iron-rich mineral. So that's why they got such good results. And basically they just kept going back to, uh, to that site and, per and basically use those samples, those fossils, as a way to perfect the methods of uh, X-ray uh, imaging. Then in the 30s and 40s, that's when we have the first systematic and widespread use of X-rays to actually study fossils. So again, this was done at, with the invertebrates from the Hunsruck slate. And then paleontologists just use x-rays to describe new species, but also to even document soft tissues associated with those invertebrates. Then came the Second World War, where everything stopped. And then things started again in the 60s and 70s. And this time, a mobile x-ray lab was brought in the field in Germany in order to basically x-ray the rocks looking for fossils. 
So it's the work of a paleontologist of the time, Stormer, who actually made X-ray imaging techniques more commonly known to the paleontological society. Uh, the, there are various techniques, X-ray techniques, that are available to paleontologists today, ranging from the very simple to the more complex. So I'll give you a brief overview of the different techniques that can be used. Uh, the first one is what we call planar X-rays. So it's a very simple method that dates back to the late 19th and early, tw early 20th century. And there you just place your fossil on the table, and then you X-ray it, and what you get is actually a 2D image through uh, the center of your specimen. And those x-rays everybody's familiar with, if you've been to the doctor for a broken leg or lung infection, that's usually the type of x-ray uh, you'll get. Then a more recently used technique is called computed tomography, also known as CT scanning or CAT scanning. And here the method is slightly different. Basically, you place a specimen on the table. The table slides into the opening of the CT scanner. And then the machine will acquire a sequential series of slices through the specimen as the specimen just slides through uh, the opening. So with uh, the data gathered by the instrument, you can actually look at a 2D image through your specimen, or if you compile all the slices together, you can actually generate a 3D model of the internal structure of your fossil. Today, CT scanners are much more widespread and more easily accessible. You can have access to CT scanners in hospitals, specialized clinics, uh, lots of universities have them, and nowadays more and more museums have their own CT scanners dedicated for research. And then the latest method used is what we call the synchrotron. The synchrotron is a particle accelerator, so it's basically the size of a, a very large building. And inside the building, you have a particle accelerator that actually speeds up protons and electrons to almost the speed of light. And then you basically bombard a specimen with different wavelengths of energy. It can be X-ray, can be UV rays, can be infrared. So that tool is really powerful because it allows you to see the fossil in 3D, but unfortunately it's still in its infancy when it comes to the application uh, to paleontology. So I won't be talking about the synchrotron uh, now, but you'll see more and more research will actually uh, involve the use of synchrotron in their uh, techniques. So just some basic stuff about uh, x-rays. Well, first you need to have basically a source of x-rays. The x-rays basically are ejected out as a beam towards a subject. And then the x-rays will travel through materials of different density. X-rays will travel more easily through materials of low density, so they'll create images that will either be black to gray in shades of color, and then X-rays will travel uh, less easily through materials that's denser, and more X-rays will be bounced away from uh, the photo. So that's why denser objects will appear as white on an X-ray photography. X-raying living organisms is really easy and provides really good results. Unfortunately, when we're dealing with fossils, we have to face uh, some difficulties that are associated with the process of fossilization. Because a fossil is no longer a bone, it's actually turned into a rock. So here's a little cartoon that just basically illustrates the different changes that occur uh, during uh, fossilization. First, your animal needs to die, then gets buried under soft sediment. And then uh, years after it's been buried, basically there's going to be groundwater rich in dissolved minerals that will flow through the area. It will actually turn, uh, basically minerals that are in solution will precipitate inside the pores of your soft sediment and will start replacing the, uh, the, comp the components of your bones so that the rock will, uh, the sediment will turn to rock and then the, f uh, the bone will turn into a fossil. And then, millions of years later, erosion will reveal part of the fossil, and a lucky paleontologist will stumble upon it and bring it back to the museum. So here's an example of the type of changes that occur uh, to a fossil due to fossilization. Here's a bone. You can see the bone has changed color. It's now brown because new minerals have been added to its uh, composition. But the inside of the bone, which is usually porous, what we call a cancellous bone, is now filled with a lot of new minerals that were precipitated during the process of fossilization. And that will actually affect the results of the CT scan or the X-ray imaging. 
So here to illustrate this, I've put uh, two CT scan slices on the screen. On the left, you have a CT scan through a humerus of a modern rhino. And on the right, you have a CT scan through the humerus of, I'll move this a little bit. There, should be better. Sorry about that. So on the right, you have a CT slice through the humerus of a centrosaurus. So it's basically a late Cretaceous ceratopsian from uh, Alberta, and it's roughly the size of, of a rhino. And you can see clearly the difference between the two images. On the left, you can see clearly the dense cortical layer of bone, and the inside of the bone is much more porous. So you can see in black basically all the empty space inside the bone. And on the right, you can see that the distinction between cortical bone and cancellous bone is much more subtle and even blurry in area. You can see the cortical bone layer on the outside, but here you can see this is all pores, but you can see that some minerals have precipitated inside the pores such that now the x-rays have much more difficulty spotting where the contact between cortical bone and cancellous bone is because of uh, fossilization. The effects can be even more dramatic. Here are uh, images of embryonic bone, dinosaur embryonic bones. Here you can see to the naked eye that the embryonic bone is really porous. You can see there are lots of pores, so the bone is not solid. And on the, in thin section, so if you look under a microscope, you can see again that the embryonic bone is really porous, but all the pores are filled with calcite, a mineral that was added on during fossilization. Now if you take that bone and you CT scan it, you'll see that the x-rays won't distinguish any internal structure to the bone because the calcite and the dinosaur bone are of the same density. So the x-rays don't see any difference in the internal structure. So if all you had to basically infer the internal structure of a bone was a CT scan, you'd think that the bone is actually solid, but in reality, it clearly isn't. And then other changes, even more dramatic, can be related to the addition of metallic minerals during fossilization. So uh, metallic minerals can be added to the bone itself during fossilization, or they can be present in the sand or in the matrix when the uh, fossil is actually being buried, such as grains of sand that are made of uh, some kind of iron oxides. And oxides or metallic minerals usually are really reactive with x-rays. X-rays will bounce off violently of those minerals and appear as bright white specks. So you can see here, that's a CT scan through the, the brain case region of the Gorgosaurus specimen, a Terrell specimen that's on display in the 25th anniversary uh, gallery. And you can see that basically there are so many uh, metallic minerals in the rocks that basically all the x-rays are bouncing off and basically not revealing any internal structure to the skull. And we know that there should be a, a brain case or brain region in here, but because there are so many uh, metallic minerals, all the x-rays are basically being bounced off and creating lots of artifacts such that we can't see the internal structure. So despite all the possible pitfalls of using x-rays on fossils, most of the times we'll get good results that actually can be useful for, uh, for research. So here I've listed four different goals for which paleontologists use uh, x-ray imaging. And basically what I'll do now is just basically give examples of research that has been conducted to achieve those different goals and for which they've actually used uh, x-ray imaging. So first, x-rays can be used to assess the presence of fossils inside a rock. That's probably one of the earliest use of x-ray imaging in the history of paleontology. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, x-ray techniques were developed at the Hunsruck slate in Germany because they got such good results. So I figured that basically I should probably give you examples of what they have over there and why it's important to use uh, x-rays in the research of those fossils because there's still research going on uh, that place today. So uh, the Hunsruck slate is uh, lower Devonian in age. It's about 400 million years old. Here's a view from the quarry. You can see it's in low mountains. And the rocks over there are just finely laminated slate, so basically fine-grained marine clay. And basically, paleontologists go over there, and just like at the Burgess Shales, they just start splitting, splitting open the rocks and looking on each piece of rock they find, see if there are fossils uh, preserved. 
The, the site is world famous for the quality of preservation over there. You can see you have some very large animals like this 16-armed starfish that's beautifully preserved. There's some very weird arthropods that are really closely related to some Burgess shale animals. And then you have some beautifully preserved trilobites as well. But you also have lots of very small animals. Like you can look at the scale. This animal is about three centimeters across. So they're very, very small. And sometimes they're so small that you don't see them on a piece of rock. They actually are within a sheet of rock. So that's why x-rays are useful to actually find the presence of fossils. So here in this rock, the paleontologist clearly seen that there was a little starfish sitting on that rock. That rock is about three to four millimeters in thickness, so it's a very thin uh, sheet of rock. So uh, basically, the paleontologist decided to put it in the x-ray machine and see if there were more fossils in that piece of rock. And you can see here that the starfish comes out really nicely in x-rays. That's because it has absorbed some pyrite crystals during fossilization. So it comes out strongly on an x-ray compared to the background rock. But what the paleontologists were really interested in, they already knew that there was a starfish there, but they saw that here in the lower right, I don't know if you can see it, there's a very light shadow, a ghost in the lower right corner, and this doesn't appear like anything in this part of the rock. So they decided to just go ahead and dig in a little bit farther to see what that outline was, and they discovered that it was basically a beautifully preserved small arthropod that basically showed no evidence of being there in that four millimeter thick rock, and basically if it hadn't been for the x-rays, they wouldn't have known that there was actually preser something preserved within the thin sheet of rock. Here's another example that was a slightly thicker piece of rock, about eight millimeters in thickness, and everyone could see that there was a starfish curled up at the lower end of the rock. But paleontologists, again, put the piece in the x-ray machine, and then they discovered that there were two other starfishes, one on top of another, basically somewhere inside the piece of rock. And the, spe the preservation is amazing. You can see even the little suction cups on the arms of, a, of those starfishes. So again, that's an example of basically, if they hadn't used x-rays, they would have never known that there were actually two better specimens preserved inside uh, the piece of rock. Other examples of x-rays being used to uh, infer the presence of fossils is much closer to home. It's basically from the upper Triassic Solite Quarry in Virginia, so in the east, on the eastern seaboard of the US. And those rocks preserve fossils that date back to the beginning of the age of the dinosaurs. The site is famous for preservation of insects and arthropods. You can see here a fossil spider and a series of insects, and those appear as white impressions on a very dark rock, so they're really easy to see. Unfortunately for vertebrate paleontologists, the bones are much harder to see because they're black on a black rock, so they're really, really hard to see. Here you can see on this piece of rock, you can look at the scale, it's very small. It's a very small animal that's preserved on a piece of rock, and it's really hard to see, and the bones are so small that basically it would have been too risky to actually try to prepare that specimen. So paleontologists decided instead to try to CT scan the piece of rock in the hope that maybe the bones would come out more strongly in contrast uh, with the rock. And their bait, bet actually paid off. They can see very well the skeleton of the animal inside the rock. The skeleton comes out as a black, black bone, whereas the rock comes out as a gray matrix. So they were able, basically, based on the CT scan, to recognize that there was a skull there, a very long neck, uh, part of a vertebral column, and they could see those long, thin spines of bones sticking out of the side of the animal that were actually really intriguing. Then they came across that other specimen there, and they got really excited. If you guys can see the specimen in there, you have very good eyes, because basically there's almost nothing exposed. The only thing that the paleontologists saw were basically a few ribs exposed here and a few vertebrae exposed at that part of the rock. And then otherwise, all they could see were basically pieces of plant matter in the rock. But there was no other evidence of any bone in that rock. So again, they brought that specimen in to be CT scanned. They focused in that area, and they discovered that there's a nearly complete skeleton preserved inside the rock. And the only things that were exposed were the bones here and basically the bones of the neck there. So again, they were able to recognize that it's a nearly complete skeleton from tip of the snout to the base of the tail. 
And again, they saw those elongate ribs sticking out of the side of the animal. So that's a really weird design, but we have animals that have the same things today. If you go to Southeast Asia, there's a bunch of species of lizard called uh, the gliding lizards, and they have the same thing. You can see they have long elongate ribs sticking out of their sides, and that, those ribs actually support a wing membrane similar to the fingers of a, of a, of in a bat wing that we saw in the talk last week. So because the fossil and that modern species have similar structures, those long elongate ribs, it was inferred that the, the extinct a uh, reptile probably had similar lifestyle. So it's been called Mechistotrachalus. It's a long neck flying reptile. Uh, even though it looks like a lizard, it's actually believed to be more closely related to crocodiles, uh, dinosaurs, and birds. And what's interesting is that I think this example is the only case where a fossil species was described based solely on x-ray images and not by looking at the, at the physical bones themselves. So it shows that there's lots of potential in terms of x-ray imaging and describing new species of vertebrates. An example of using x-rays to uh, determine the authenticity of fossils is this guy here. If you've been at the Terrell Museum for many years, you'll be familiar with uh, this example. So enter Archaeoraptor from the early Cretaceous of, uh, of China. This animal is from the same uh, rock beds that actually uh, delivered or produced all of the amazing feathered dinosaurs uh, from the uh, from the Owning in China. Uh, that animal was discovered in 1997, so only one year after the, the first paper on feathered dinosaurs came out. So that was, specimen was discovered really early in the history of feathered dinosaurs from China. So we didn't really know what could be found there and basically uh, uh, the state of preservation of these guys. So that specimen was claimed to be a missing link between non-avian theropods and birds because the animal seemed to be a toothed bird with a dromaeosaur tail. So it seemed to be the perfect link between dromaeosaurs and birds. Unfortunately, a specimen turned out to be a composite. Uh, Kevin Allenbach, who used to be a preparator here at the Terrell, had worked a little bit on the specimen and had warned the paleontologists that he believed the specimen was actually a composite of about three to five individuals. And indeed, the CT, scan, uh, CT scans proved them right based on how the bones lined up and also on the, the texture of the rock. If you look here in those rocks here, you can see there's faint laminations and two blocks side by side don't have the same laminations. So they concluded that, in fact, the bones did not belong together, and some of the rocks did not even belong to that slab. And they concluded that actually the slab that contained Archaeoraptor was actually a composite of at least five different pieces of rock and probably five different individuals. So uh, after further study, they discovered that indeed the front half of the animal was a toothed bird called Yanornis that had already been described. And the back end of the animal with the tail came from a dromaeosaur, a small four-winged uh, dromaeosaur called uh, Microraptor. So it's not surprising that Archaeoraptor was believed to be a missing link between dromaeosaurs and birds because it was, in fact, both a bird and a dromaeosaur slapped together. Farmers were just basically collecting fossils, and they just glued the pieces together to try to make it more interesting for uh, potential buyers. But CT scans and uh, study also by uh, the human eye actually revealed that it wasn't actually a single specimen, but a composite of several specimens. Uh, now I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how we use x-rays to uh, study the internal structure of fossils, because paleontologists are often interested in the inside of a specimen, what's inside of them, but at the same time they don't want to break the specimen in order to look what's inside. So that's when x-rays become really useful to, uh, to basically describe what's going on. So, uh, some of those research projects involve purely descriptive studies, so just describing what is inside the fossil, and other times it's used for functional purposes, so try to infer the function of a structure. So I'll talk a little bit about descriptive analyses first, and then I'll move on with the more interesting uh, functional studies. So the first case I want to talk about is a case that made the news of 10 years ago now, uh, the case of the dinosaur heart. Probably everybody's heard about it. Uh, 
The case revolves around a little animal like that called Thessalosaurus. It's a four meter long ornithopod from the latest Cretaceous of North America. It's a pretty boring animal, but its main claim to fame is that one of the specimens there actually preserved a large concretion inside uh, the anterior portion of the thorax. So here, just to orient yourself, the animal is actually lying on its left side. So here you can see that those are the ribs forming the rib cage. That's the shoulder blade or the scapula. That's the articulation for uh, the, the front arm. And here at the front of the rib cage, you have that large iron concretion that's sticking out uh, of the thorax. So paleontologists were perplexed and intrigued by what that concretion actually represented. What was its origin? So they decided to CT scan the specimen and see if they could shed light on the origin of that uh, iron concretion. And that's the, the data they published here. They claimed that within the iron concretion, they could recognize two ventricles and a single aorta, the aorta being the big blood vessel f coming out of the heart. So they claimed that the f iron concretion there was actually a fossilized heart. And they published that, and I think it's in Nature. And then basically that's when people got really upset. Basically, some paleontologists started arguing that basically uh, a heart could not fossilize, it could not be turned into an iron concretion, and then basically it got really ugly, and I'll basically spare you what everybody called each other. But anyway, then a paper came out, and then they concluded that saying, basically, the, the iron concretion could not be a heart, but they didn't say what the iron concretion was. They just said it's an iron concretion, but they didn't try to explain what it actually represented. They just said that it could not be a heart. So that was the final word for 10 years. And, and here I forgot to mention, here's the reason uh, what the paleontologists interpreted that uh, in terms of biological meaning. They said that two ventricles in a single aorta meant that this dinosaur was, uh, had a high metabolic rate and was probably endothermic like uh, birds and mammals. And that's why people got really upset. But here's the reasoning uh, the, these paleontologists Took. If you look at the, the uh, circulatory system of ectothermic or cold-blooded and endothermic and warm-blooded animals, you can see that their circulatory system are very different. Uh, ectothermic animals, their heart have a single ventricle, so this means uh, oxygen-poor blood and oxygen-rich blood mixed together, and then they come out of the heart, and then they go through the body into what you would, could call two aortas. But if you look at warm-blooded or endothermic animals like mammals and birds, you can see their hearts have two ventricles. So one ventricle for the oxygen-rich blood and one ventricle for the oxygen-poor blood. Then the oxygen-rich blood comes out of the heart in a single aorta. So the fact that the dinosaurs had two ventricles and a single aorta meant that the dinosaur would have been uh, endothermic. So that's why people took a lot of, uh, basically, uh, were really upset about uh, the conclusions that a con concretion could be a heart, and they ended up saying that basically a concretion was not a heart. And then last month, just last month, 10 years after the, the original paper was published, there's this uh, paper that came out, and they actually looked at the dinosaur heart again, but this time they used several methods. They used high-resolution CT scans, they looked at thin sections, and they also did geochemistry on the heart to try to figure out what the structure was. And here I've highlighted their conclusions. They say that all of their microstructural studies suggest that the heart is in fact just a cemented mass of sand grains, and then the geochemistry does not suggest that there's any biological origin to uh, the iron concretion. So that's the final word that came out uh, recently. Uh, so the dinosaur heart is just a, an iron concretion. It's not a heart, but maybe in a few years we will actually eventually find uh, fossilized dinosaur heart. Then uh, another case of using x-rays as a descriptive study is uh, research I've been involved in with uh, Darla Zelenitsky from the UFC and Don Brinkman here from the Terrell. That was the case of the gravid turtle. Uh, that's the skeleton of a 75 million year old turtle from southeastern uh, Alberta in the one four, discovered in the 1-4 area. And you can see when the specimen was discovered, the shell was broken, and inside the shell, there were fragments of eggshell actually preserved there. So we, the paleontologists knew right away that the turtle had been buried before it laid its eggs. 
So uh, that was a really cool discovery because it was the first uh, case of a gravid turtle in the fossil record. And during preparation, it was, it was discovered that there were lots of eggshells under the carapace here on this side. And CT scans also revealed that there's eggshell all the way on this side of the carapace. So we were wondering, uh, basically, could those be more eggs inside uh, the body of the mother? Or could they just be, have been basically pieces of uh, those eggs that were washed in? So we compared the size of uh, the turtle to modern turtles, and we inferred that actually it could have had more than just the five eggs that were visible. So it possibly could have been uh, more eggs there. But the uh, definitive answer came out of looking at modern literature on modern animals. So here's an x-ray of a modern turtle. It's a turtle in, uh, from Florida. It was hit by a car, so a good Samaritan stopped by and picked it up, brought it to the vet. The vet uh, x-rayed it, and they discovered that inside the turtle, there were eggs. So we see here that the turtle was gravid at the time it was hit. And you can see here that the eggs go far forward in the front. They can be located as far forward as where the limb, the forelimb retracts into the shell. So that actually provided support to our study, and we concluded that actually uh, the, the, the Alberta turtle was probably uh, bearing more eggs on that side. And if you're interested in the fate of that turtle, it survived and had many, many offsprings after that. <laughs> then the last case of a descriptive study is really impressive, so that's why I'm going to spend more time talking about that one. It shows how, basically, advanced the techniques are in X-ray imaging and how you can actually describe fossils using X-rays without ever actually seeing them with your naked eye. You actually never see the bones, but you get to actually study them based on X-rays. And that's the case of the elephant bird egg. If you're not familiar with elephant birds, they're an extinct, a recently extinct type of birds that lived only in uh, Madagascar. It was the largest bird that has ever existed, up to three meters long, uh, tall, 400 kilos, so that's 880 pounds. So it's a large bird, looked like an ostrich, and it's believed to have went extinct either in response to uh, climate change or to basically human hunting, but maybe not human hunting adults, but instead human going after the eggs to make a big omelet. So uh, you can see here these eggs are very large. You still find actually elephant bird eggshell in Madagascar today. If you go on the beach, if you dig through, sift through the sand, you'll actually find pieces of eggshells coming from that uh, basically have survived the last 300 years and basically are, are still intact. But you occasionally find uh, el intact elephant bird eggs. And here's a photo. It shows basically the size of the elephant bird egg compared to an ostrich and a bird. But that photo doesn't do any justice. So I decided to bring an actual cast of basically the egg of an elephant bird. So it shows you how truly gigantic those eggs were. They're basically as big as basically the eggs of uh, Hypercrosaurus tibingeri we find in Devil's Coulee. So those were the largest eggs uh, ever discovered for, for a fossil bird. But what's really cool about some of those eggs is that two of them were made famous uh, thanks to basically what was discovered inside of them. Uh, the story begins in 1967 when uh, private citizens in Madagascar donated two uh, intact uh, elephant bird eggs to a National Geographic uh, reporter who brought the eggs back to Washington, D.C. And then for the fun of it, they decided to x-ray one of the two eggs. And to their surprise, they actually discovered that there were actually embryonic bones inside the egg. The egg was intact, so there was no way of actually sh seeing the eggs. But the x-rays shows that there were lots of bones inside the egg. So that photo made it into the 1967 issue of the National Geographic. There was a brief mention that there were eggs with embryos, but no one's ever studied uh, the specimen in details. And then sometime between 1967 and 1999, the egg disappeared, presumably passed into private hands, and now basically no one knows where it is, and it's basically lost to science before it could actually be studied. But there's a good news to that. The second egg basically stayed at the National Geographic Institute, and then in 1999, it was brought to Texas to be a CT scan there, and they discovered that inside the eggs, there were also embryonic bones inside that egg. This time, the paleontologists 
basically jump right on it, CT scan the eggs in details, and basically the embryonic remains were actually the subject of a, of a detailed study, and the results were published in 2007 in uh, the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. So here I just want to show you uh, the steps I actually went through to document, basically, and describe all the bones that were inside the eggs. So first, they CT scan the entire egg. Here you see it inside view, and here the bottom view. And you can see that basically there are embryonic bones that have fallen to the bottom, presumably when the embryo died, and basically the egg just dried up, all the bones fell to the bottom. So what happened then is that uh, the CT images had to be processed to remove everything that was not a, a bone, so basically remove everything that's eggshell and everything, every residue that would be inside. And here's how it's done. This is a slide of uh, Amanda McGee, a master's student at the University of Calgary. Some of you uh, know her. She was not involved in the 2007 paper on, this, on the often bird embryo, but uh, she's doing the same techniques that uh, they did to study her own master's project. So I've decided to use a few slides, a few photos of her to illustrate what they did. So first, you need to take every slice, every CT slice, and then in a computer that uh, we, uh, we use called Amira, we actually go through every slice and in three planes, the X, the Y, and the Z plane, we actually select the bones and then delete everything that is not bone. So after that first wave of image processing, what you're left with is just basically the bone contact, content inside the egg. So here you have a top view of the bone content of the egg, and you can see clearly there's bone everywhere, but you can see here there's basically a pile of debris that you can't really identify. But on the left side, you can see there are some bones that are really, uh, really easily distinguishable. So you can see here there's a, metata a metatarsis, which is a foot bone, and right here there's a premaxilla, so it's the tip of the snout of, a, of, a, of a, the often bird. The problem with only one wave of uh, image processing is that all these bones are still, still stuck together in the 3D image. You can't actually pull them out and basically rotate them, look around, look underneath on the side to see what the bone actually looks like. So you have to go through a second phase of image processing where you go again through all the slices and then you start basically selecting specific bones that you're interested in and then basically deleting everything else. So now you again trace in the X, the Y, and the Z axis. You trace every bone and then you remove everything else. And then what you're left with is basically a bone that you can actually rotate as you please and look at it in any orientation you want. So here's the example of the premaxilla, where you have a side view, top view, and front view. And here's the, basically uh, the metatarsis that you can look basically dead on or basically from the top. So that's a great, but a great tool because it allows you to actually document bones, describe them without even seeing them to the naked eye because these bones are still inside uh, the egg. And now you can actually look at them on your computer screen. So what the paleontologist d did then is actually went through the whole pile of bone fragments and they basically just started isolating every single bone they could see. So they recognized a lot of post crania, so lots of bones from the skeleton, but they also recognized lots of skull bones. And they discovered soon enough that they had a complete skull, but all the bones were disarticulated. So what they did at that point is actually isolated all the bones, and then they used a prototyper or a 3D printer, if you want, and they just basically created exact replicas of the bones in 3D, physical copies of the bones that they could actually handle in their hands, and basically move around and try to match together and build back the skull. And that's how they were able to actually reconstruct the skull of an embryonic uh, elephant bird. So here basically are side views, tub views, and you can see the skull is fairly small, only five centimeters long. So they were able to, f for the first time, uh, human eye could see what an elephant bird baby would have looked like. And then you can also compare it to the skull of an adult elephant bird, because we have basically uh, complete skulls of elephant, adult elephant birds in museums. So you can compare size differences, but also uh, differences in proportion, so that gives you an idea about growth in the, that fossil bird. And finally, they were even able to determine at what age the elephant bird embryo died. What they did is they looked at the degree of ossification of the skull, so this means to which extent the bones of the skull were formed, and then they compared basically the bones of the elephant bird embryo to the embryos of the ostrich and the chicken, 
and they concluded that the elephant bird embryo died shortly before hatching. So it had probably gone through 80 to 90% of its incubation period, and then it died at that moment. So that study actually illustrates a good example of basically the amount of technological task or feeds that needs to go into uh, basically CT images in order to reconstruct uh, the biology of, uh, of certain extinct animals. I'll talk briefly about uh, functional analyses that can be done by CT scanning uh, fossils, and that's research that I've been uh, involved with uh, in personally. Uh, the one case I use, because they make good graphics, is basically the case of the airways and the in dinosaurs. There's a group in, uh, at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, the Whitmer Lab, led by Larry Whitmer and uh, his crew, who are really interested in looking at basically air spaces in the skulls of dinosaurs, so airways, sinuses, and, and such. So they basically CT scan the skulls of dinosaurs and then see how the different uh, noses are shaped, if you want. So one group they looked at are the ankylosaurs, the armored dinosaurs. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, there's two different groups of uh, ankylosaurs. There's the nodosaurs with large shoulder spikes and no tail clubs. And then there are the uh, ankylosaurids that don't have big shoulder spikes but do have a tail club. Uh, they also, these two lineages also differ in terms of their skull shape. Some have more elongate skulls and others have more rounded skulls. So the Whitmer lab was interested in determining basically with different skull shapes, do the airways look different? So the tube that goes from the nostril to the throat and then to the lungs, are there differences between these different lineages? So what they did is actually CT scan different skulls and they used the same method that was used with the elephant bird embryo. Instead, this time of going through every slice and selecting the bones, instead they selected the empty space inside the skull to trace how the, uh, uh, the airways were going. And I have a little movie, hopefully it will work, that shows actually what kind of there. So here, it's a little jumpy, I don't know why. You can see now the CT scan, we're going through the skull, we're going through the nose region, those are uh, the airways. The white specks are metallic minerals, so they reflect x-rays a lot more. Now we're going through the, uh, the head region, going to go through the brain. So these paleontologists actually just selected everything that was empty space, and then basically deleted every, all the bones, and then they actually looked at basically what the airways were doing and how they differed between uh, the different species. And they were surprised to discover that nodosaurids and ankylosaurids have dramatically different airways. If you look at the nodosaurids, they have basically, uh, when the air comes into the nose, it goes through two loops before making it into the throat and then eventually the lungs. But if you look at ankylosaurids, you can see the air goes through a roller coaster ride. It's back and forth, up and down and around before it eventually makes it into the throat. So it's really bizarre why these two animals would have such dramatically different airways. The reason why they're so chaotic could be that it would be a way to actually create turbulence in the air when you exhale, and then you recover moisture when you basically exhale so you don't dehydrate yourself, which is a big problem if you're endothermic. But it doesn't really explain why the two, uh, the two genera, the two taxa, have totally different uh, airways. Another possibility is maybe, just like for the case of hadrosaurs, these airways were convoluted to actually act as a resonating chamber to create a different noises. So basically, that way, a nodosaur and an ankylosaur, when they basically blew air through their noses, they could have possibly produced different sounds so that these animals would have sounded differently in addition to looking different. That might not be such a far-fetched idea because the same has been claimed for hadrosaurs. So here again, the Whitmer lab joined force with uh, someone well-known here, Dr. David Evans. They looked at uh, hadrosaurs or duckbill dinosaurs and they compared two different species that have crests that look relatively similar. So they compared Hypacrosaurus and Corythosaurus and they CT scanned them and again they chose basically selected everything that was airway, deleted the bones and then they compared the airways in these two species. And they discovered that basically for animals that have crests that are roughly similar, the airways are totally different. In Corythosaurus, the air comes in through the nose, goes up in the crest, and then down to the throat. 
But if you look at Hypercursorus, the air goes up into the crest, down again, up higher in the crest, and then into the throat. So uh, Dave Weissample in the 80s had suggested that the hollow crest of uh, hydrosaurs could be used as resonating chambers to, to produce different calls. And this study here actually supported the claims he had made, but this time using CT scans. And they show that actually the crests may have looked similar, but if they were used as resonating chambers, it's possible they would have produced different sounds so that species could have recognized the calls from each other before basically uh, seeing each other. So, uh, so that was a cool study that actually showed some of the internal structure in, the, in dinosaurs. And here's that's the res research I'm uh, personally involved with. It's uh, basically uh, describing the brain case or the brain region of meat-eating dinosaurs. So here's uh, an example of a specimen here. It's a milk river Desplitosaurus. We had the uh, brain case CT scanned and then rendered as a 3D model. And now what we're interested in is not actual bones, but actually the endocranial cavity. So the cavity inside the, uh, the brain case where the brain was actually sitting. So we can actually describe what it looks like, what the brain looked like, and infer some functions. So here's a little movie that actually illustrates what this guy is doing. So first you have the bones, you go, on, you go through the brain case, then you basically phase out the bone, remove everything, and then you're left with basically the empty space, so the endocranial cavity. And here you can see that's the thinking part of the brain, the cerebral hemispheres, and that's the olfactory bulbs, the, res the part responsible for the sense of smell. So basically, by removing all the bones and just looking at the endocranial cavity, you can say a lot about uh, basically what uh, these dinosaurs were doing in terms of function. One study that was done was actually look at the inner ear of those dinosaurs. The uh, inner ear is really useful because it helps you to actually determine what was the head posture of these dinosaurs when they were at repose, basically when they were resting, not on high alert. And that's because the inner ear is formed, uh, contains three different loops that we call uh, semicircular canals. And those loops are responsible for your sense of balance, telling you if you're tilting from one side to the other, front or back, or spinning around. So it's been discovered that in modern animals, when the animal is at rest, the lower circular canal is always in the horizontal plane. It's always parallel to the ground. So that gives you the reference position for, to tell you if you're tilting one side to another. So these paleontologists, knowing that, went ahead and CT scanned lots of skulls of meat-eating dinosaurs. They all positioned the skulls so that the uh, lower semicircular canal would be horizontal. And then they discovered that actually head posture varied a lot between species. Some species like Allosaurus, T-Rex, have the, what we always picture them as basically holding their heads up. It's always basically with the snout straight up and the eyes looking forward. But if you look at other species like Nanotyrannus, uh, Ornithomimids, and Troodontids, they actually have the, the snout pointing down when they're looking straight ahead. So that gives you a lot of information about basically what the animals look like, how they should be reconstructed in museum displays or in documentaries, but also gives you information about their biology. If these guys are always pointing down, it might be that they're always trying to crop or grab at food that might be down. So uh, it gives you a lot of information about the appearance of these animals, but also uh, their biology. And finally, the research I was involved with in is basically a study of the sense of smell in dinosaurs. What we did is actually we looked at the reconstruction of the brain region in these dinosaurs, and we looked at the parts we call the olfactory bulbs. That's the part of the brain that's responsible for the sense of smell. And it's been shown uh, in modern animals that the relative size of the olfactory bulb is correlated with certain biological parameters of these animals, but it's also related to how good your sense of smell is. So the bigger the, sense of, uh, the olfactory bulbs are, the better the sense of smell is, or at least the more reliant on smell uh, a given species is. So what we did is we CT scanned lots of uh, different species, looked at the relative size of the olfactory bulbs, and then basically looked for patterns. And we saw that basically among different species, we looked at 21 different species of theropods, and we discovered that there is a trend with body mass. So you can't just simply look at the size of the olfactory bulbs. You have to take into consideration how big the animal was before you can make any inferences. 
what we saw that basically there was a trend among theropods. There's lots of species that fall right along the line, suggesting that that was the typical sense of smell for, uh, for these theropods. But then we have lots of species that fall way above the line alongside the alligators, and then lots of other species that fall way below the, the regression line. So based on that, and comparing with patterns we saw in, the, in modern animals, we concluded that there were some species, like the tyrannosaurs and the dromaeosaurs, that had a very good sense of smell, or were more reliant on their sense of smell. It, was, it played a more important role in their biology than other species. And based on what's going on in the modern, we basically postulated that maybe these animals could have been active in low light conditions, such as at, uh, at dusk or dawn, or maybe even at night, when vision is not so good if you're looking basically for your food or you're walking around, then maybe smell would be more important for you. And then it also could be related with basically large territory that you have to patrol, or maybe even looking for food. Maybe you rely more on smell than other species to look for food. Then there were some species that were just typical for, uh, for theropods, like the allosaurs, ceratosaurs, uh, troodon, and archaeopteryx had typical sense of smell for uh, theropods. And uh, what was interesting is that we found that these species actually had a poorer sense of smell than alligators. That's not saying much because alligators have a very good sense of smell. They can smell a putrefying carcass up to three kilometers away. So just saying that your sense of smell is poorer than that of an alligator doesn't mean that you can't smell. It just means that basically you probably couldn't smell something that was three kilometers away, but it could still have been a very good sense of smell. And then uh, we found that there were some species that actually had relatively poor sense of smell. The ornithomimids and the oviraptorids had basically very small factory bulbs compared to other species. So we concluded that smell was probably not as important for them as it was for other species. And that's not really a surprise. Lots of people have suggested and had noticed that ornithomimids and oviraptorids have very large eyes and large optic, uh, optic nerves. So it's been suggested that maybe they were more visual animals based on those uh, features, and sense of smell seemed to be uh, agreeing with that. And we also found that basically, if you compare with modern birds, species that have smaller olfactory bulbs tend to be omnivorous or herbivorous. It's not 100% accurate, but it's, it's a trend. Most species are either herbivorous or omnivorous. So maybe ornithomimids and oviraptorids were omnivorous or herbivorous. And again, there's lots of lines of evidence in the fossil record that suggests that, yes, these species could have been at least omnivorous, and some of them may even have been herbivorous. So our study actually kind of confirmed uh, some previous results. Then I just want to conclude my talk by showing you uh, cool graphs of examples of how CT scans can be used to render species, uh, render fossils as 3D models. And that can be done either for research purposes or for educational purposes, such as in museums. So I'll just talk briefly about this one example of 3D rendering. It's called finite element analysis. It's an engineering principle that basically allows engineers to model in computer space a building or a bridge and see how it will withstand stresses uh, if basically it's, it undergoes loads, like when a train or a truck drives on it, or in case of earthquakes, for example. So the same technique has been applied to uh, some fossil species, some fossil taxa, and they actually can infer something about the biology. So here's a paper where they compared, they used a finite element analysis to compare the skull of a modern lion to the skull of a saber-toothed cat, the Smilodon. And basically they modeled uh, basically these, uh, these 3D renderings to see if a Smilodon could actually bite the same way uh, a modern lion does. So it's been showed here, you can see those are the levels of stress. Blue means very low stress, nothing's going on. And brighter colors mean higher stresses, so the bone is under a lot of uh, stresses. And it's been shown when the lion bites that basically the stresses are usually limited to the teeth and the skull is usually perfectly suited to handle everything. The skull does not, does not undergo any stresses. 
But it's been shown here, if you apply the same, uh, same types of loads in a smilodon, you can see that the entire skull would undergo a lot of stresses. So that tells you that the smilodon probably did not bite the same way, uh, basically, a modern lion does. So it probably did not kill its prey the same way. So uh, there's lots of studies going on like that. Lara Shaikowsky at the U of A was working here also does a lot of work on, uh, on theropods to model them as finite element analysis to infer what their behaviors were. And finally, uh, 3D renderings could be used for educational uh, purposes such as for uh, museum displays. So here's an example of a, a fossil mammal, it's called an antilodon, well, it's part of the group called antilo, uh, antilodonts. Basically, they are closely related to pigs, so basically they're uh, even-toed uh, ungulates, and uh, they're basically the size of uh, probably sheep, all the way some of them were close to bison in size. And they're uh, really cool animals, probably the coolest mammals ever, no offense, uh, Craig. But uh, basically, you can see here, you can actually make the skull spin around, phase out the bone. You can see where the teeth are and where the brain is. And then you can make it talk to actually uh, scare away little kids. <laughs> so uh, basically, those models can be used for uh, basically museum displays. But they are also used in documentaries on the TV, National Geographic or BBC. They often put those 3D models on to actually either guide their illustrators into basically what the animals would have looked like, and sometimes it's just to get some scientific input into uh, the renderings. So uh, this concludes my talk. Uh, just want to basically emphasize a few points that extreme imaging has many applications in paleontology. And now with CT scanners and synchrotron becoming more and more available, you'll see more and more research that actually use X-ray imaging as one of their techniques. So basically, it's going to be a more and more frequent uh, things. And it doesn't hurt also. You can produce very cool graphics, which usually please a lot of people. Unfortunately, we saw there are limits related to uh, the use of x-rays with fossils. Fossilization actually modifies the bones a lot. So that's why, basically, oftentimes we don't get good results. And you never know beforehand. You actually have to CT scan this fossil to see if it'll get to a res a good results. You can have two fossils from the same formation, like fossils from the dinosaur park formation. One will give you extremely good results. The other one will give you totally crappy results. And basically, it, it varies from fossil to fossil. And basically, the only way to know for sure is to actually CT scan uh, what's available. And then I think I speak on behalf of all the paleontologists and all those who do field work. I think we all await the miniaturization of X-ray instruments so we can actually bring them in the field with us and basically use them to actually look for fossils. And basically, wouldn't it be nice to just put those on and then you know when you find bones if basically you're dealing with a complete skeleton and if it's worth collecting it or if it's just an isolated bone and then basically just leave it in the ground. So I uh, just have a few things that I'd like to say. I'd like to thank, uh, first and foremost, uh, Sandra Mills from the Drumheller Hospital, who's been really generous with her time and patience for basically helping us CT scan some of the specimens. Uh, it's greatly appreciated, so thank you. Uh, also, I'd like to thank some of our colleagues uh, who've done research, Larry Whitmer and Ryan Ridgely from Ohio, who's done, who have done yeah, lots of research and basically contributed lots of data for our research. Apostolos Kansas, who let us at times use a CT scanner. Canada Diagnostic Staff, where basically we used to bring in our specimens, and they were always had a big smile when we walked in. And then uh, lots of people actually helped me uh, basically during my CT scanning endeavors. And then I just put those uh, things down here. If you want to see more examples of CT scanning data that's freely available online, or you want to see some of the cool movies that I've used, they can all be seen and even downloaded from the web. There's a Whitmer lab, again, where you can get lots of 3D renderings and even some of the CT data if you want to do your own research. And then there's a Digimorph data, uh, database at the University of Texas at Austin, where basically they have a long history of CT scanning everything from fossils to modern species, and then uh, putting the data available for further study. So with this, I'd like to thank you all for your time, and hopefully I didn't go too long. <laughs>